And then there definitely often is and probably needs to be more of a conversation with the audience. And each one of these participants in the conversation, I think we have them in formal and in informal ways. So particularly maybe with the critics and the journalists and the academicians, it comes out fairly formally. It comes out in terms of a printed or broadcast review of a play or a preview of it or in the article about a piece of work. Um, but increasingly there's more of a dialogue back and forth, both online and in person. And so there's formal and informal ways that we do that with each one of them, certainly with the artists and with the audience as well. We survey, we have um, particular feedback you know, sessions, or you might just watch an audience watch a play or listen to what they're talking about in the lobby before or after, or monitor your, your Facebook and Twitter sort of responses. So there's, there's formal and informal ways that we're having these conversations. So with all of that in mind, I thought I would start by asking each one of the, the people at the table to just jump in and begin to think about why do we have the conversation um, from your point of view, and, and maybe with that, how, how can we work at bettering that conversation from where you are coming at it from? So, somebody jump in. I think as a, uh, as a professor of theater papers, we have, um, we've given up responsibility to, uh, to theorize our own work, to set our own criteria, and we, we've given it over to, uh, to people, people like Rob, who has a different uh, agenda than we do in terms of the work, um, who's, and we, we praise the theater critics when they are brilliant and like our work, and we condemn them when they're somehow sleeping and short-sighted and don't acknowledge our brilliance. And, but I think that um, but as a community, we have really there's our own responsibility to have that conversation. So I think part of the reason to reinvigorate the conversation is not just to um, improve someone else's work, but improve our thinking about our work. And in that way, I think, uh, begin to, to think more responsibly, more collectively, and more generously in terms of all three of those audiences that we're speaking to, uh, each other and ourselves and our grandparents, uh, to the, the critical community and to our larger audience. I'll jump in. Um, I've been uh, studying for the last five years the group theater, uh, who I would say, without doubt, was our first American ensemble theater. Uh, I've been writing a play about them, which we're going to workshop as part of the factory. And their members were in constant dialogue in, around, between the work they spent their summers together working in the country. Uh, they also had a community of support that interacted with them that included people like Aaron Copeland, Mark Strand, the photographer. So it wasn't just theater people. And of course, Harold Clerman, who provided the initial vision, uh, never stopped talking uh, long after the group theater and his collective reviews are like this. So he was a director, a critic, uh, a public intellectual, a practitioner. Uh, and for me, that is just an incredible, inspiring piece of ancestral DNA that I would, I would if, if a tiny fraction of that could come through to our time now, wow. And uh, so I think we do this because we're mammals, we have limbic systems, and we can't survive without it. We need each other, and we need to uh, talk about it all. And when I say each other, I don't, I mean about all of us here and more. Uh, not just the people who literally uh, write the scripts, direct, get on stage, do the lights and design, but the people who care about theater, whether they do it professionally, or, you know, at the risk of, of uh, jumping off the deep, deep end in a way, I'll say I think it, it comes down to a form of love. Well, I guess I, I would say, uh, though, though I am an artist, I, I'll, I'll take the producer uh, mantle uh, today because I, I think that would be appropriate. 
Um, I, uh, I, ha I have a number of experiences with ensembles because ensembles are really my passion. That's the one that I come from, and yet I work in a very uh, uh, traditional institution. Uh, and so um, I really try to make relationships, uh, personal relationships, with people that I've actually commissioned so that I actually go to their spaces uh, and I, um, you know, we become friends. And I feel that I put a lot of, uh, in, in supporting them and ushering the group through my theater, I am putting a lot on the line. Uh, and, and knowing this, um, I have uh, groups that tr trust that my feedback to them is honest and in an effort to make the work better. Uh, in whatever they want, they, they have to ask me questions because I don't want to say, I don't want to put my aesthetic on their aesthetic. And so um, this is how, for example, with Ruth Mex, uh, I've created a, a relationship with them. We had a commission. Uh, it was rough going. I, I went to their space in 09. I've never been so happy as the piece. Went through a very rough process. The piece wasn't working. I gave copious notes. And interesting, I felt they really took them. And uh, they premiered the piece in their space in Texas. Our, our staff went to do it, and we are now doing it in our season. So it was a great success story on a piece that is not traditional of what we're doing, but the relationship, I, I feel, was really uh, um, personal, uh, slow going, and trusting that we both were committed, passionate, and have, have, were taking risks with each other. And uh, I think that that's a very uh, important thing. Can I say another thing? No. So, NIFA. The New England Foundation for the Arts. I'm on the advisory panel. Very, very interesting experience. In this last round, it was highly competitive. And at, at some point, you're know, like, they didn't cross their T's. Uh, you know, it, was, it was that competitive. <laughs> and, and so, uh, when we finally got down to the last 20, we were um, asked to mentor a group, two groups. And I picked people I didn't know. And it's been an interesting experience because I could give them information that no one else was really willing to do because they knew that I wanted to help them. And that's been such an interesting experience. Very, very open. For example, guys, you're, people think you're like college, that when you were early on, your reputation uh, started as if you guys were like this fraternity, and now you've matured, you all have families, and that perception has to change. That's a hard note to give. But because they were like, okay, we're at this point, we want to get this, what, what is it, how do we change the perception of ourselves as a group that we're just not downtown uh, New York. And so, again, it's that, I feel it's those, it's finding those people that you can leave or trust that you, that, you, that, you, that you can trust to not try to change your aesthetic, but to listen to what you want to do and then respond. So. I'm pretty excited to hear Diane talk about the same art things. Uh, and uh, I'm a, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a pretty thin skinned person. I, I don't think it's going to be more fun. Um, but I do feel like a, a lot, I just think that we're too polite. I think that audiences are too polite. I think that uh, we're afraid of having an audience. I, I see people in theater afraid of having an audience discussion in which people did say, I liked it, I didn't, I hated it. Um, but that is, I've heard people say that's not useful even today. And I guess I kind of feel like. It is useful. I, I, I don't think everybody has to be constructive. I think they have um, Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and I do look 
to other forms and art forms. You know, it just seems like in, in the world of music, even in the music criticism in the weeklies, people put out much stronger opinions uh, with a lot less helping of the audience. <laughs> Um, and I feel like uh, theater, I, I think the interesting thing about this convening is sort of drawing a comparison between how we talk in the theater and um, I don't know what it is. I mean, I don't know if it's the fact that our, the material of plays is people, being, being people on stage, and maybe it's that realism is the dominant form, and so you can't <coughs> talk about the work without saying, without being afraid that you're talking about um, the person, that you're really judging the person. I was so interested when Conrad said, the most honest feedback I got was when we did a radio play, and we sat and we listened, and everybody knew that that was art and not <laughs> the person. And so people could just say, I don't understand this, this isn't good. It's, and, 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 and there it was, I mean, I don't, I don't actually know the answer to that, but I certainly sense, it certainly feels like, uh, like the dialogue is much less robust and there's a lot of concern about it you know, in a way that, you know, yeah, in a way that, that works. I, 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 I think there's a way of talking about work. Uh, and, and I think you can be very tough and very honest, but I, I don't know. I, I would. I would want. No, I don't know that I can have something me, you know, about my work. Uh, so I do think that there is a way of doing it that you can still be honest. I, I think we're society providers. Um, I think we have. Um, that we don't really invest in conversation. That you know, um, late night late night TV interviews now are just a series of one liners uh, or self promotion. And uh, political conversation is just a yelling match. And I, I think conversation, to really invest in a conversation, is to invest a great deal of time. And so we lie instead. We give you know, uh, a couple of sound bites, and that's good enough. Because we're not sure the other person is as invested as we are in the conversation we want to have. That's why I never talk about a show with somebody while the show is up. I say, I say this is really interesting work. This is great. Uh, if you want to talk about it later, come see me. Yeah. Please, you know? And then if they if they call and say, let's have a beer, then I will invest in the conversation. I feel that uh, I ask myself, am I ready to invest the time and effort it's going to take to really set up a, a, um, a responsible conversation? I mean, how many of you tell the truth on a first date? You just don't do that. You don't do that. You don't have a second date. Um, and, uh, and you're not sure you want to, you want to trust that person yet. So to set up a relationship is really difficult. It takes time. And then I ask myself, am I ready for this conversation? Have I done my homework? Am I prepared? Mm -hmm. And is the other person ready to have this conversation at the same level I am? If those things all coincide, then I'll have a real conversation about the work. But otherwise, I think my job is to be supportive, to be enthusiastic, uh, to be committed, and, and lie. <laughs> I, mean, I was really I was impressed by what you were talking about in terms of how the way with your, with your work with Rudy Max, and that it was based on this kind of trust that you built up, and that it was over time, and that it was personal, and, and so I'm thinking, Rob, you've been, you've been reviewing here in the Bay Area for how long? 30 years? 30 Maybe years. 30 years. So you have, I mean, there's always been groups coming on and what is coming on, but you actually had a really long-standing relationship with so many of the artists and so many of the companies, and, um, and you, ha you can't wait until the show is over before you give your opinion. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm wondering about that, and I'm also wondering about who you see, uh, clearly you're writing for the paper that has a very large circulation, but who do you, who are you talking to? Boy, that is, <laughs> uh, you know, I still don't know, um, because it changes constantly. Um, when, uh, when Dan was talking about you know, constructive feedback, I think, I think the critic's job is to be to give constructive feedback. Constructive feedback, in my definition of it, means that you have to be completely honest about your reaction to the piece. And it's true. I I would love to have the the luxury 
Um, and it's more than a luxury. It's it's a uh, you know it's it's it's, it's, an, it's an enormous gift to be able to talk about the piece in the kind of depth that you can in a conversation. I'm carrying on an, an instant reaction to the piece as I've seen it at that particular moment in its gestation, and I know that for many companies that that piece is going to continue to develop beyond the, the opening night, but I have to talk about what I have seen on the opening night or as close to it as I'm there. And I see myself, I see the critic as part of a continuing conversation that's been going on for 3,000 years with the art form, with the artists, with the audience, and with my readers. Um, and a lot of times the readers really, you know, let me know what they feel. And I, I have never, well, I can say never, I very rarely found unanimity. <laughs> In fact, if a piece um, generates strong feelings, I can almost always count on getting you know, a, a number of people who say, I can't believe that you liked such and such. <laughs> and a similar number of people will say, how could you not have gotten the magnificent you know, work that's being done here? How could you be so blind to it on the same piece? Right? Um, so, I feel as if my job is to try to be part of that conversation. I, I am always hoping, always have to trust that people take what I say as being simply my response and not coming from some Mount Olympus, some you know, that I, and I don't see myself in that role, but that I'm trying to be the most honest and constructive in terms of putting things in context within the art form, within the society that we live. And it gets harder and harder to do that as the space within the paper shrinks. But I do, I do feel that that's where the critic field fits into this conversation. Can you get into a back and forth dialogue? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's that like? Um, I can. I. There are. Uh, I find it a very useful and positive part of, of the job to be in when theater artists respond to my work, often privately. Um, and want to continue the conversation. And in those cases, it's always best to wait until sometime after the show has closed. Um, but I've, you know, there's been certainly a number of people that I can count on over the, over the decades who have been, you know, there to tell me when they feel that I am totally, that I've totally missed the point of something or to continue to you know, want to continue a conversation about a point that I've raised. And I think that that's, that, that's that, that hopefully I think that that's important, that that can be useful to the artists and to the art form, but it's very useful to me. I think that's important. I know that these days as, as I get older, I don't engage in a conversation that I can't learn something from, that can't potentially change my point of view. And I think that uh, when I'm asked to comment on a particular production or a play in process or uh, something somebody's working on, um, I want that conversation to really challenge my aesthetic, in a sense, challenge my criteria, as I hope all great, you know, all great performances do. And I want that conversation to really enrich me. Um, so I don't come at it as a point of saying, okay, let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you firmly but hopefully what will fix your play. Um, that's, as a dramaturg, people expect you to do that. I say, tell me what it is you're doing, and uh, tell me why it's valuable, and let's discuss that. Let's, let's find out what this is about. Let's explore this together, and in the, after the conversation, let's come to a truth. 
rather than applying the truth. Corey, what you were saying, or yeah. in a sense of discovering, um, discovering the reason for doing something in the act of doing it, including the act of uh, talking about it. Absolutely. And it's very important for theater artists to be aware of the difference between dramaturgs and critics. Oh, yes. <laughs> I teach you a program of dramaturgy and dramatic criticism, so that push and pull is really very evident to me. <laughs> I, I certainly have had, had the, the experience of going to see a play that had been, you know, rewritten, a play that I had earlier reviewed that had been, that had been completely rewritten and being urged see it and go back to see it and sit there and think, oh, Lord, they did just what I said. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> So uh, this is just occurring to me, and I 
hearing trust and champion and, um, and understanding the aesthetic. And I'm just wondering if there's, is there a danger? And I'm not sure if there is. Is there a danger by surrounding yourself maybe almost solely with people who really do come from where you're coming from? Understand your aesthetic that you trust. And you know, maybe there's a, a circle around that, that that doesn't get what you're doing. But maybe that's okay. it's like what you were saying, Rob. You get your almost every review that you have that's wrong. It's good to have people who agree with you or people who feel like you got it wrong. And we're not trying necessarily to do our work for everybody, right? So I, I'm, I'm, first I thought, well, that maybe, maybe there's a danger, but maybe there's not. And I wonder if it will. That's such a good question, Rob. I was just thinking about um, many years ago. I, I, I used to work with a theater company, uh, an ensemble group called Theater Village, and the, and the way I first started working with them, um, we all hang out in the same bar and you know, had chatting and stuff. And I went and saw a production of theirs, and they did a Romeo and Juliet. And after the production closed, I sat down and talked with uh, Matt Song Garcia, who played Romeo, and I told him what I thought about the show. I told him in very naively uh, direct form. Of, uh, while the concept was brilliant, it didn't work for these reasons. And uh, he was very happy with the conversation, as was I, about an hour and a half. Um, and after that point, the man who directed the production, Dominic mean, Suran, never spoke to me again. <laughs> <laughs> he committed the bar, he said, the top set of the bar. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, about six months later, he came up to me and he said, hello, I'm Dominic Suran. And he said, yeah, I know, he's to talk to me about um, <laughs> Somebody's doing this production and we'd like you to work on it with us. And I said, okay, so you won't speak to me for six months, but you won't be working on the show. So my father told me not to surround myself with people who agree with me. And I said, I would be, I'd be happy to meet with you and talk about this, but I want to make sure uh, that we are on the same page about why you want me there. Right. And we had an amazing eight-year working relationship based on that conversation, the conversation, the critique, so to speak, yeah, right. or my thoughts on Romeo and Juliet. It was, it was fantastic. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah. But I don't think and that's right for everyone. But I, I think what we're talking about, I would assume with trust and uh, knowing where someone's coming from, does not mean homogeneity or agreement, right. as Paul is saying. It means a kind of uh, openness, everything on the table, uh, and an assumption that, yeah, the person has that we have a common goal of making this the best, right. uh, rather than somebody from the outside coming when you don't know what they, they, they might want you to fail for whatever <laughs> crazy reasons. Uh, and certainly, and the other thing I just wanted to say is about the hard, hard talk, saying hard things. I know, for me, it's been a lifelong struggle to stop saying the hard things to myself all the time. I think all of us as artists and Americans face that. We're so conditioned to be, you know, convince ourselves that we, we suck. Uh, and then it gets reinforced and, you know, and that, a lot of that's the struggle. So if we do need champions, we need to also become our own champions. I just heard, this is on NPR, I think, the other night, but that life from the inside always looks to the individual person, looks like one series of failures after another. <laughs> I guess what I'm 
concerned about are two things. First of all, when first of all, the way that these talkbacks are conducted, um, I think are very like um, people are uh, walk on the shelves, uh, and there's sort of a, a, a desire to not let there be a, a good argument happen in the talk. So I, I tend to see, uh, and uh, whereas I think it could be, I don't know if there could be something where people sort of had permission to speak more aggressively and respond aggressively and even say, that, that feels terrible, this is what I'm thinking about. Or, I don't know, something a little more dramatic and less friendly. Like on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not like on YouTube. Which I think, I think the, the risk you run is therefore people just show off what we were talking about in terms of our horrible political discourse, where we just show off how cutting can you be and, yeah. and undercut yeah. people about things which they don't even care about. Yeah. Um, but to really get it, that you can care about. And, the, and I guess the other thing that, that I, and I won't get into this, but was, uh, I guess it, it bothers me when um, people after the show tell me, well, I'm not an expert on fear. And, I, and I'm like, no, 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 come on. You know, uh, and I do some non traditional work. I often have people say, well, did this happen? I don't know if this is what happened. And I say, tell me what happened. And I would say, more than 90% of the time, they absolutely got what happened. But they didn't feel like they could, and I don't know how I could lay the groundwork for it. It just, it just seems that, it seems a shame to me that people would be provoked by a theater, excited about it, and leave and say, well, well, um, that's not something that I should be talking about. Because, and that's something also where I feel like, well, if we can be more robust about it, yeah, and, and I guess I sort of have this paradoxical notion that it sort of it feels to me like it's running the wrong direction. That uh, actually, in the talkbacks, we, we care about those people, so we're really, really gentle. But actually, I think the nervousness is what gets communicated, and then people spoke more robustly, angrily, disappointedly, happily, uh, all over the map. Uh, then people would say, "Well, I have a right to have uh, you know, too, and I, I don't have to have all this." I'm excited by the vocabulary and I want it instead of what it did something that people had said before. That's what we did. I mean, I do a lot of those discussions, right? And I, I think that nervousness uh, on my part uh, comes from the art, come from protecting the artist. I honestly don't want discussion to be let me rewrite the piece, right. which is what we're all afraid. I mean, we don't want to hear that. I think the odd, the conversation is often more robust when the artist isn't there. And I think your question is, how can we make it that robust with the artist in the room? And I, I, I it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a training of the audience as well. One of the things that we're doing is we're in theater barriers in the middle of the national, we commissioned a national study by Alan Brown on the intrinsic impact of the theater experience on the audience. So in six cities with 18 theaters, including the public and the arena, and both big rapid a host of much smaller theaters. Um, and I'm, I've been wondering, I haven't actually talked to Alan about this, but this concert, it, it, the whole thing is to try to plumb with the individual audience member how they responded to the work, both emotionally and intellectually, and did they bond with the people on stage, did they bond with the people around them. Um, and I'm wondering if there isn't sort of within that those that sort of construct a way to conduct a more useful feedback session because it would not lead to rewriting the play, but it would give the playwright or any of the generative artists an idea of how the audience was in fact responding to what they just saw and heard. And it might not even be what you imagined, but you might be delighted with where they wound up, even though you didn't expect them to go there. Or you might be like, oh my God, I have no idea if you wind up there. That's not what I wanted that to happen. But I'm just wondering if just sort of getting them out of their heads and into the more visceral, emotional response that they had, which you cannot argue with. You had it, you had it. No one does it. You know, Brad, I love push shows, I, I love push shows and I've done it for many, many years. But I think that it's, it's the wrong environment to have that kind of conversation. I think that uh, most of the discussion is 25 minutes long. You want as many people as possible to talk and get a whole series of one line. What I think is a better a better model is Pierre Carlson, I think model, yeah, yeah, taper of the coffee pot. 
where a group of people come together for a couple of hours, like a book club, and talk about the experience in a really meaningful way. Yeah. And they become engaged as a, as a community as well as a lot of people. They are forged into a community by the participating in this. And I think that's something we should be encouraging. A long conversation about the individual audience members' um, engagement with the project. And they're learning how to talk about theater, and they're excited about that. But we're also learning how they talk about theater, and we're excited about that. It's a new conversation. Yeah. Yeah. We, we actually found that because we, we find that we have a little bit more honest reaction to the show without the artist present, <laughs> that we have this program that we do at the Douglas. Two weeks ago. <laughs> it's, 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 we call it the concierge program, and basically we have these, these you know, people, and they have, uh, they, they meet the audience in the beginning and talk and, you know, become friends, and when people come out, they stop them and go, what did you guys think of the show? And people stop, and they input these little iPads, and they input what they thought, and, and we get these amazing reports. And it's very interesting because it's very honest, very smart, uh, and and we share them. We share them with the artist. And it's a, a, a really kind of interesting, it's almost production reports, but from the audience first hand uh, at any moment. And who are the concierges? We, are they, 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 they're staff. And they're, they, you know, a lot of them have been ushers for many years, and then they, we, we developed this program. Uh, and, and, and they've really taken it on. They're very proud to do it. It's, uh, every usher wants to be concierge. And, you know, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Because it's a real interaction with the audience. Um, you know, uh, people remember them. And when they come to the show, they have their favorite concierge. And, you know, it's a real cool thing. And it puts a face to the Douglas. You know, we really we should be doing it at the table. Oh. We should be doing it at the table. We don't, we had, at this point, don't have it. So it's very, you know, but I think it'll move. So I've been getting notes from Ben that um, we should move on to the next part of it. What are we doing then? Have another breakout session like we did after the last panel. So how does that work? Uh, I would say that if you were in the room here last time, you should go to the union. And, but no, no, we should mix up the groups. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> how about that third over there? You're seated in that bank of two chairs. Go over to the union and the rest of us can stay here.